Star Wars is famous for being a self-contained trilogy that later became episodes 4, 5, and 6 of a much larger story. Other than being a nightmare for newcomers, it tore fans apart. Some people liked the prequels, and quite a few others, to put it mildly, want to forget that Jar Jar Binks ever existed. I'm sorry it ruined Star Wars for you people, I really am, but you don't get to complain until I get Knights of the Old Republic 3. You want to talk about how midichlorians hurt you? Let me tell you about how watching the exile go off into deep space and then hearing nothing hurts. Similar disagreements lies with fans of the Star Wars animated series, with Star Wars Rebels being pitted against the Clone Wars. Hey everyone, I'm Tim with Channel Frederator, and today we're comparing Star Wars Rebels to Star Wars The Clone Wars, the, the 2008 series, not the, the movies. Though they take place at different time periods, they do include a lot of the same characters and the same galactic backstory, so we feel somewhat comfortable comparing and contrasting. So get ready, because we're counting down eight things Star Wars Rebels does better than Star Wars The Clone Wars. Let's get started. Number 8. The stakes are higher. Rebels comes between the two completed Star Wars trilogies, while The Clone Wars comes between episodes of the first chronological trilogy. Because of that, in The Clone Wars we know exactly who lives, who dies, and who disappears from the story before you ever watch the first episode. Obi-Wan has to make it, because he's in episode 3 and beyond. Because it uses mostly characters from trilogy canon, they have the thickest plot armor imaginable. The crew of the Ghost, by and large, doesn't get that luxury. So yeah, we know Lando and Darth Vader make it, and the Organa family has to have some survivors, and R2 and 3PO survive, but not necessarily all in one piece. Other than that though, pretty much everyone's on the chopping block. The entire crew of the Ghost, Agent Callus, Ahsoka, Hera's father, and all of the characters that made it out of the Clone Wars alive. Hondo Onaka made it out, but he isn't around in episode 4. Maybe that's because he's off trying to beat Han's Kessel Run. Maybe his luck ran out and he was summarily executed for his crimes against the Empire. Or the Rebellion could have killed him. That's another thing that totally could have happened. Sure, we know the Rebellion has to get formed and it has to win, but almost nobody in the show is guaranteed to see that victory come to pass. If Dave Filoni and his team harbor any George R.R. Martin tendencies, they'll have every opportunity to let them loose. And that makes it way more exciting to watch. Number seven, it does a better job tapping into nostalgia. Let's not pretense this one. James Earl Jones comes back to play Darth Vader in Star Wars Rebels. You can pretty much open and close it right there. I mean, not only is the character and his design iconic, he has the most iconic breathing condition of any character in fiction history. The Clone Wars had many talented voice actors, but to see people like James Earl Jones and Billy D. Williams making appearances again is just outstanding. Seriously, when's the last time we got a proper Darth Vader? He's a wonderful embodiment of the power the dark side possessed. He's so awesome that Kylo Ren is basically just his fanboy. When anyone even mentions the dark side, most people think of Darth Vader. And another point in the nostalgia's favor is how the lightsabers are done. If they look really thin and odd to you, it might be because you've seen a lot of the remastered versions. The lightsabers in Rebels are actually kind of amazing. The animators are rendering a rod that is spinning around to give the same light deflection effect that the original lightsabers had in the original trilogy. That is on a level of nostalgia very few even attempt, let alone succeed at. Number six, it nails the Star Wars aesthetic. When you talk to Star Wars fans about the look and feel of the prequels, answers can be a bit divided. While the sequels do have their fair share of supporters, probably people who are fan of big lightsaber fights, a lot of fans find that the prequels don't have that Star Wars look to them. This extends to the Clone Wars since it's set smack dab between two movies. Star Wars Rebels is closer to that look a lot of Star Wars fans were looking for, as it mostly tries to use designs by Ralph McQuarrie, who did the concept art for the original Star Wars. Co-creator Simon Kinberg wanted the show to have more of a homemade look similar to the old films, and basing it on McQuarrie's paintings gave it that old-school hand-drawn style. They also took some of McQuarrie's art that was never even used in the films and used it to create more storylines. That look and feel alone bring fans back to the films they first fell in love with, and it helps create that feeling when we're watching that, oh yeah, this is Star Wars. McQuarrie's artwork was loved by fans, so seeing it used in Rebels feels a lot like coming home. Number five, the morality is a lot more complex. The story is more desperate and exciting. In Rebels, we see a world where the Jedi and Dark Side start to mix. Ezra wants to use the powers of the Dark Side for good. In the Clone Wars, the Jedi were still an established organization with a mission of combating the Dark Side. Kanan and Ezra don't have people to guide them. They have to figure out how to navigate the light and dark on their own. And neither of them has complete Jedi training that would help them make those decisions. And to make matters worse, as far as they know, if they die, then the light side the Jedi wield would be snuffed out for good. Ezra wants to use the powers of the dark side for good because frankly, the forces of good are at the end of their rope, scattered, disorganized, and unable to communicate, and they're used to scraping for whatever they can get. So when Sith knowledge presents itself, it's not just a question of good and evil, but survival. And their survival is constantly called into question. The Clone Wars tapped into good and evil mingling as well, but it was at a higher, more abstract level. We were looking at things like political corruption and intrigue. Characters were worried about their positions, but they were never quite on the brink like they are in Rebels. In Game of 
Thrones terms, Clone Wars is the action at King's Landing, and Rebels is the action beyond the wall. Both are important to the show, and both are neat, but for raw excitement, you're not gonna beat the action beyond the wall. Number four, Rebels takes place in a more interesting time period. There's a period of time between each movie that goes untold. In the past, other media served to fill these gaps, such as comic books, video games, and novels. In the Clone Wars, the story is set before the Jedi are betrayed and killed off. The Clone Wars is set before Order 66 from Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Everything's set in stone. Star Wars Rebels takes place between two trilogies. It's a time period filled with unknown adventures just waiting to be explored. And it's a time period that's canon just got wiped clean. There are very few places that are as blank in the Star Wars world. So while we can probably guess the main beats that are going to happen in Rebels, there's so much more we don't know. There's so many more characters we can be introduced to. The Clone Wars takes place in a roughly three year period between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. But the span of time in Rebels is a lot closer to 18 or 19 years. And Rebels is zooming us in on one of the coolest ideas that would have to happen in that time, the beginning of the Rebel Alliance. There's so much that's iconic and exciting about the Rebel Alliance that we're getting to see the origin of in just little ways, like the Rebel symbol being a phoenix. That was something I didn't know and is super cool. And while you could probably have speculated it, we get to see in action that the rebellion was several Rebel cells on different planets joining together and finally fighting the Empire as one unified force, which is frankly way more exciting than just thinking, oh yeah, there's a Rebel Alliance at the beginning of episode four. It almost goes back and retroactively makes episode four more exciting because it puts into context the effort and sacrifice that went into making a Rebel Alliance in the first place. Number three, a new animation style. The style of animation in Star Wars Rebels looks a lot smoother than the animation in Star Wars The Clone Wars, though actually the animation in Star Wars The Clone Wars evolved a lot over its run. Part of the problem comes from budget and the other part comes from learning how you want to develop your own style. Budget is largely solved by having Disney acquired Star Wars, and all the lessons learned from the Clone Wars still carry over into Star Wars Rebels, so it has the benefit of more money and more experience behind it. And that makes for animation that just looks and feels a lot smoother. And that just brings the animation of Star Wars to a new level. Also something that's really neat to see is a lot of the action shots are pushed in a lot more to be a lot more intimate in how they focus on combat because we're not dealing with large scale battles anymore. Number two, it puts more focus on common people. Star Wars Rebels shows us that not only do Jedi save the universe, but common people do as well. After Order 66, most of the Jedi are exterminated. This leaves the Rebels to fight against the Empire without much in the way of a force arsenal. Even though the odds are stacked against them, the Rebels still fight. Each character has their own unique reason for fighting against the Empire. A majority of Star Wars fans dream about becoming a Jedi, but defeating the Empire came off the hard work of a lot of unlikely normal people. In The Ghost Alone, we have a broken droid, an ex-soldier, the last Padawan, a Force-sensitive boy who looks suspiciously like Aladdin, a graffiti artist, and an ace pilot who all come together in a beat-up cargo ship that they strapped some guns to. And somehow they prove themselves against the Empire. Star Wars Rebels proves that you don't need a lot of midichlorians to be a hero. Number one, Star Wars Rebels has its own special place in Star Wars canon. A lot of these things that make Star Wars Rebels better than the Clone Wars is that it's much more independent from the movie franchise as a whole. While the Clone Wars struggled to adhere to canon structures between episode two and three, Rebels played with the freedom of having a story based in a time of complete uncertainty. In the Clone Wars, we saw the normal constructions of Jedi Masters and their Padawans and the State of the Republic, and we're familiar with those. What we haven't seen is the survivors who were left to endure Order 66, or how the Rebel Alliance came from a grassroots movement. Star Wars Rebels became its own series with its own unique character. Rebels has done a much better job of having its own unique identity in this greater Star Wars canon. Ezra and the Ghosts have earned their place. The Clone Wars did a great job of taking the prequels and adding more context to them, but Ezra and the crew of the Ghosts earned their own place in the canon on their own merit. And that's something that the team who made Rebels, which is the team that made the Clone Wars too, should be immensely proud of. And hopefully this paves the way for more unique contributions to the Star Wars canon. Once again, my name is Tim and I'd like to thank you for watching eight things Star Wars Rebels does better than the Clone Wars. We know that there are things that the Clone Wars does better than Rebels too, so let us know what you think of both series. Also, if you like this video, make sure to subscribe so you can see more videos about your favorite cartoons every week. And remember, Frederator loves you, or more on point for this episode, may the force be with you.